So this is uh, MySQL Tuner 2.0. I called it a better MySQL Tuner. Have you used MySQL Tuner before, the first version? Okay. Well, the first version uh, was made by a guy named Major Hayden. His first name is Major. Um, and it, the intention was to be a quick sanity check. So it looked at some status variables and some system variables. It looked at memory architecture tables, you know, made sure you were on a 64-bit uh, system if it weren't gave a warning. Uh, but not all the recommendation uh, that it had were relevant. So it would, if the query cache was off, it would say turn it off, which might have been okay 10 years ago, but not so much now. Now, really, the recommendation is turn it off. So um, everything was hard-coded what to check, the thresholds even. So, you know, if you had a threshold, if, you know, it would give a recommendation if you hit a certain threshold. So if the table is more than X fragmented, you know, you couldn't change that. It was, I mean, it was in a Perl script, so you could change it, but it wasn't in an easy way. Um, and, you know, what the recommendation was, like turn off query checks was hard-coded, and the output was hard-coded. You could, there were some parameters so you could ship, skip, just skip some of the checks, but not all of it. Um, there was no offline mode, and in fact, the reason I started working on a second version was because we had a lot of people who said, can you just do like a couple of hours and look at my configuration and tell me if it's okay? So we wanted to be able to run it in an offline mode, not a remote mode. It already had a remote mode, but I mean, where you fed it uh, some of the details, like how much memory it had and how much, um, what, what the architecture was, 32 or 64 bit, and then it just ran it given the output of show status and show variables. Um, so that's why I started doing it and then it became into this. So my skill tuner 2.0 is still a quick sanity check, um, but it's much more flexible. It's guided by a configuration file, so you can change the thresholds, you can change what to check, you can check one thing or you can check a hundred things. Um, and it can be remote or offline. So how does it work? Well, it's in Perl, just like the original MySQL tuner. Um, it gets the information into a key value hash. So whether it gets the information by querying show global status or by slurping in from a file that has that output. Uh, currently, it's just status and system variables. So for example, a key is max connections, value is 100. Um, but it could be anything. For example, you could have the key be the database dot table name, and the value is the size of the index plus data plus from information schema. That's not in MySQL Tuner 2 one, but it could be because it just gets some data, and however you get the data, then you can parse it. So there are many supported flat platforms. You know, it runs on Linux, it runs on uh, Windows, runs on whatever. Anything you can run the Perl on it runs on Mac OS X. Um, you can get information from files. So if you do the dash dash file list option, you can give it a file, uh, or one or more files. So you can have, let's say you have vars.txt, or status.txt, or keyval.txt. Um, and if you do a dash dash file list, it does not log into the database. So some, somebody at one point asked me, well, what if I want to give some from the database, but some from files? So it can easily be extended to do that. So the, the hard part is, here is the configuration file. So instead of having everything hard coded, we have a configuration file now. So the delimiter is three pipes, um, because the beauty of MySQL Tuner 2.0 is that it just does word replacement and then evaluates it. So you can use Perl functions, you can use Perl code, so having a one pipe as a delimiter wouldn't work. I like using pipe as a delimiter because it's not usually something that's going to be in. Something that's going to be quoted, you know, if you use a comma, you can have commas and things, so I like to use pipe as a delimiter, but pipe and, and two pipes is an or in Perl, so the delimiter would be in three pipes. Pound is a comment, and basically each line has four delimited things. The first one is the label, the second one is the comparison and value, the third one is the expression, and the fourth one is the output. So the label and the expression are always printed out, for example, uh, and, and by expression it's the evaluation of the expression. So percent slow queries, it might be 13.25, where the expression would be uh, slow queries divided by questions times 100. That's the expression. But the evaluation of the expression is 13.25. So no matter what the label and the expression are always printed out. And uh, how it works is it just parses the configuration file. So I've put things in colors. Um, and basically you start with the label comparison expression output. And this percent slow queries is an example just grepped from the thing. And so you have the label, the comparison. So if you greater than 5% slow queries, then it's going to print out the output. 
which is too many slow queries, either increase long query time or optimize the queries so they're no longer slow. So I think the original MySQL tuner just said increase long query time or just said, hey, you've got a lot of slow queries. So this doesn't tell you necessarily what to do. I mean, you write it out, and I have a default configuration file which has some of these. But if you're not a DBA, this isn't necessarily going to help you because it's just going to say, oh, what's going on? But it's a quick sanity check if you are a DBA so you don't have to do this all, all yourself. Or if you have something that you constantly want to monitor, you can do that using the script. Um, the slow queries and questions are replaced with the hash values that it get, got. So those uh, are status variables and it replaced it with the information from show status or from the file that you have. The expression value is then calculated. The comparison is made is to greater than five. Uh, now you can have any kind of a key you want. You know, we happen to get the value of, of show variables and show status and put those into keys and values. You wouldn't want to, for example, have a star or a slash be a key because it would do a word replacement. And then you wouldn't get the divided by the multiply. So you want to make sure that you're not going to overwrite keys, that you're not going to have, that, you have, that your keys are unique space and that they don't override anything, any other things that you use. So um, basically, if, if the comparison is true, I said it's going to print out the too many slow queries if you actually have the dash dash recommend option. There is another mode that I have that, that uh, I have, and I'll probably go into it. Uh, there's probably a slide coming up later on it. But the output format is by default pretty, which is what you've seen percent slow queries. And then it says, you know, too many slow queries. And it gives the number, colon, number. There's also a CSV format. So you can output to CSV so that you can do something like run it once a month and then compare. You know, run it once a month, put it in a spreadsheet, make a graph, or put it into our RRD tool. Um, and so yeah, so the comparison and value, the comparison expression are both in Perl. So you can say, there you can see the, the pointer, um, supported version, for example, let's say that's the label. Um, so here's the, here's the expression, the substring of version 0 comma 1. So the very first character of the version, if it's not 5, then you say version is less than 5.x, please upgrade. So it's using substring, it's using NE5, it's using Perl as opposed to just uh, from before when we had, you know, greater than 5 and, and this, very, just divided in, it's not just arithmetic, it's any Perl expression. Um, so that being said, you can write your own. And from MySQL Tuner 1.0, we had these subroutines that already existed, these functions, these defined functions that already existed, not subroutines. Um, pretty up to, oh, they are subroutines, I guess. The pretty uptime. So instead of one five seven nine six one, it was one day. One day. this is in seconds. So it's it's assuming the number is an uptime, and so it's figuring out how many days, how many hours, how many minutes, how many seconds. Pretty uptime. It's making it pretty. Um, HR stands for human readable. So you have HR num and HR bytes. So HR num. This is just a number. It's 158k, and HR bytes is 154k. Now this was in 1.0, and obviously this is, can be confusing because you could say, well, does K mean byte? You know, does it mean kilobytes or does it mean thousand? So in 2.0, we just said, hey, it's 158,000. We just spelled it out. Um, and you know, what else are you going to do, M? I mean, <laughs> that's even worse for thousand, right? And in 2.0, this is spelled out with kilobytes. So we did change the functions a little bit, not too much. But we do have two new functions in MySQL Tuner 2.0. And by two, I mean one new function. It was uh, one new function called HR by time, human readable by time, and it's for rates. So if you do something like human readable by time, slow queries divided by uptime, that's going to give you a rate, right? And so here is, you know, 1, 2, 3, 5, 1, 5, 7, 1, whatever, and what is 0.078? This is 0.078 slow queries per second. Well, what does that mean? I have no idea. So it makes it pretty. It, it basically multiplies out until it gets over 1 because it's much more easy to understand 4.69 per minute than 0.078 per second. You might say 0.078 per second, that's not bad. But to say, okay, it's about five per minute, now you know exactly how bad or good that is. So here's a more complex example. So this is the rate of sorts that cause temporary tables. So how often are you, are you doing a sort that causes a temporary table? So this is the label rate of source that cause temporary tables. This is the expression. 
and I should point on this screen. There we go. Where's my pointer? Here we go. Um, human readable buy time, sort merge passes divided by uptime since flush status. So that's the sorts per second HR buy time. Now, the comparison is, e is if it matches either second or minute. So basically, if it's anything, you know, back here when we had it was per minute, right, 4.69 per minute. So if it's anything other than per minute or per second, it's okay. Otherwise, it's going to um, say, hey, you have too many sorts causing temporary tables. So if there's more than one per minute, basically, it's going to have this output that, again, you can change this output. And um, what I have here is consider increasing sort buffer size and or read R&D buffer size. Um, I've actually now realized that sort buffer size is going to be allocated, the whole buffer is going to be allocated when you do a sort. So it's probably really better to not increase it, maybe only temporarily or maybe only for the session. Um, so again, now I could change this in my config file to say, you know, consider increasing read R&D buffer size or optimizing the query so it doesn't sort so much, maybe having a new, um, Having just having a new index will help. So yeah, that's why the temporary table is created. That's why the temporary table is created exactly. Because if you have text field, the temporary table is created anyway. Yes, if you have a text field, it's going. To, but this is specifically for sort merge passes. So specifically for sorts creating temporary tables. But again, this is something that is a little more complex than you know just is my database up. This is something that as DBAs we we do care about this, um, but we want to. You know, maybe we have a, a server that never does source and we don't care, so we wouldn't even put this in the configuration file. You can also just print out variables. And, you know, it's a little hacky to do this, but you could say, okay, I want to know what the sort buffer size is, right? Because once you get this, don't you want to know what the sort buffer size is? You know, if it's already 10 megs, you're not going to want to increase it anymore. So uh, I, I solved this by doing this. So basically, you have a sort buffer size, and if it equals zero byte, if here's the HR byte sort buffer size, so it's going to print the label and this, no matter what, the evaluation of the expression. And if it equals zero bytes, then print out there's something wrong with the value of sort buffer size. I could have said less than zero. I could have said anything. But this is what I put. So here's the output. Uh, if you have dash dash output CSV, you can see it says sort buffer size for MB. Here, sort of buffer size colon 4MB, so pretty. Um, we could probably make it so that if it's CSV, it'll print out the whole number, not just four megabytes. It'll print out, you know, four times 1024 times 1024, whatever, to get to bytes. Um, so that's, that's what it is. Now, the next slide is uh, going to show you the output of the first MySQL tuner. And it's a little small. But basically here, this top section just says MySQL Tuner 1.0, bug you know, send bug reports here, um, run with help for additional filters. Okay, it was able to log in using the credentials that pass on the command line. Some general statistics, it skipped the version check for the MySQL Tuner script itself, so it has a version check in it. Um, currently running 5137, uh, operating on 64-bit architecture, that's okay. So you see how it says okay here, that's cute. But again, it's a general sanity check. This isn't for something um, that's going to be fed into a machine to process, you know, this month versus last month. So it's, it's definitely something that's human readable only, not really machine readable, which is why I made the CSV output and made the outputs a little different. And then there are some storage engine statistics. So the status, so it didn't have archive. It says minus archive, minus BDB, minus plus EnoDB, minus ISM, minus NDB cluster. Um, it doesn't uh, say plus my ISIM because my ISIM has to be there. It's the system tables. Um, but you can see here it says data in my ISIM tables, data in EnoDB tables, data in black hole tables. And here it has, uh, so the dash dash means neutral. So there's OK neutral and then there's bang bang, exclamation point here. That it says total fragmented table 74 because fragmented tables aren't so good. Then some performance metrics, you've got uptime. Uh, here's the maximum possible memory usage. This is an example of one of those uh, checks that seems bad, right? The output seems bad. Oh, the maximum possible memory usage is 97.2 gigabytes, which is 142% of the RAM you have, right? So it's one and a half times the RAM you have. But um, this is if every single thread was connected up to max connections and it was using the entire sort buffer size and join buffer size and temporary table size and this and that, 
it's never going to use any of that. I don't think there's one thread that could use all of the memory of the per thread things because it would have to be joining and sorting and temper like everything. I don't. I just don't think it's physically possible um, to do everything that it could do. So it's not a very good uh, metric because while it's true that that is the max it could ever use, what you really want is what's it usually going to use? Because if my SQL tries to allocate too much memory, it's going to crash. However, if you set that so that number is under 100%, you're going to never be utilizing the full extent of your memory. So you need to know the best uh, case scenario. So that's one of those things that, again, wasn't so good and it's hard coded. So what are you going to do? You know, but here it does slow queries, highest usage of act available connections. This is max used connections. A bunch of other things. Thread cache hit rate, thread cache, uh, table cache hit rate open file limit used, all these things, and then here are the recommendations. So I ran this with dash dash recommend. So basically, uh, run optimized table to defragment, reduce the footprint for, memory, for system stability. That's this 142%. So it's saying reduce the amount of memory MySQL uses. Um, so yeah, MySQL's maximum memory usage is dangerously high. Add RAM before increasing other variables. But by the way, I think you should increase uh, query cache limit. Um, or and increase your EnoDB buffer pool size to greater than 57 gigs, which, you know, here the EnoDB buffer pool was, uh, the size of the data was 57 gigs, but the buffer pool was 48 gigs. That's a very big buffer pool. And yet it's saying, well, but the EnoDB data is bigger than that, so you want that all in memory. So now it's recommending that you put all your EnoDB in memory, which is a good idea if you can do it, but we're in, a, in an era now where you have hundreds of gigabytes in your tables and you, you're not using them all at once. So here's, uh, here's the, the second version of MySQL Tuner, and here is the command that I ran. Perl MySQL Tuner.pl, config, here's the fig, config file tuner default.cnf that comes with it. User, username, pass, you know, password, dash dash recommend because I wanted to kind of give the same idea. So it logged in, here's the uptime and pretty uptime. And you can see it's much, uh, much more readable. Um, and while it doesn't give you this is good, this is bad, um, it actually will on the next page because it's here's our sort rows 8.18 per hour um, and then here we've got you know thread cache slow launch time percent connections used basically all these recommendations come from things you know too many intermediate temporary tables are being created um, consider increasing sort buffer size you know so where is let's see rate of open files Let's see, rate of table open. I want to see out here. Temp disk rate is 1.72 per minute. Temp table rate is 12.84 per minute. So in the config file, I said if it's more than one per minute, uh, give me a recommendation. So that's where you know those recommendations are coming from, things like that. And it's very, it's very wordy. I put all these words in. You can change it to whatever you want. So that's what this output looks like. There are some limitations. Um, there's no grouping in the output. So you saw in the first one, it was kind of grouped. You had table statistics and then you had this. I would love to group it. I'd love to have, you know, a query cache group. And then you could kind of, you know, just comment out the query cache group if you really didn't want, if you really wanted that. Um, and right now it checks one item at a time. Uh, but that item is a Perl expression, so you can do any kinds of arbitrary calculations. But if you wanted to check that the version is, say, 5.1 you know, 47 or something or higher, you know, you might want to say, well, if it's version is five, if it's not, if it's less than five, you know, make us think. If it's less than, if the second digit is less than one, make us think, right? So that way, if somebody's on 4.1, it won't say, oh, you're okay, because the second digit is one. It, you know, you have to do two checks for that. Um, so not a huge deal. Um, and there's li limited configurable logic flow and still not a DBA in a box. So what do I mean by limited configurable logic flow? What I mean is you can't say check these query cache variables, but if the query cache size is zero, don't bother checking the hit rate for the query cache. Don't bother because the size is zero, it's not being used. So you can't configure a logic flow like that to say if this is like it, don't worry about these four checks. Because you know maybe you have uh, 10 systems and some have query cache on and some don't. So you want the same configuration file for each. So it, it doesn't do that, and that's a limitation. Um, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, the only thing is that sometimes if you are trying to check variables that don't exist, you'll get a little warning in the middle of the Perl output, and that scares some people. 
when they go to run it and they're like, oh, I'm getting a Perl warning. It's like, just ignore the Perl warning. It's fine. It's just because the variable name doesn't exist or because it's trying to divide by zero when it's doing something. Don't worry about that. Um, the next slide is also pretty busy, um, but it's the README. Now, it's uh, you know a little busy, but this is the whole README. Um, I put this in to uh, show a little bit about how I like to do documentation. I like to make it, uh, there is, a, you know, uh, you can do like a manual page to see all the options, um, but this actually shows examples as well. So here's a sample offline operation, um, MySQL tuner PL config tuner default, force mem, so this is how much memory it had, force swap, the summer swap it has, force arch is 64 bit, and then here's the file list vars text status.txt. Um, there's also, you know, here's the default mysql tuner.pl dash dash config tuner default.cnf. You can also use dash dash recommend. You know, it explains by default, it doesn't output recommendations, just the input and the value. Um, and here's, you know, some of the other things, uh, host, port, user, and password. You could put that on the command line. Um, and there's remote operation. So this is the force mem, force swap, force arch. So if you're doing it remotely, you have to do you have to force the memory, the swap, and the architecture because you're my, you're doing MySQL into a different thing. So you'll get those variables, but you can't show the memory, the amount of memory in the system, or that. Um, and then there's also the offline operations so that you can do if you have these files, say MySQL show global variables. Um, so that's basically how it can be used, um, and it's very um, there's also debugging out. You can't see this line here. It says debug. There's dash dash debug mode, um, so you can see that as well. So, you know, it's a very basic script. It's not, uh, it's, it's not extremely complex um, because it's really, the heart of it is just doing that word substitution. Um, so how to get it, if you wanted to get MySQL Tuner 1.0, you can do wget MySQL Tuner.pl because he bought the domain name MySQL Tuner.pl. So if you go there, it is really cool. That's one of the reasons that I haven't, he's, he's given, he's given me permission to just take over the project, but I haven't yet because it's not, what I have is a Perl script and a config file. And I want to make sure people have the sample config file. Um, so if you want to get MySQL Tuner 2.0, you go to launchpad.net MySQL Tuner. Um, obviously it's open to contribution bugs, ideas. The MySQL Tuner name is used with permission, like I said. Um, and I guess you can go to HTTP. I don't think it needs to be HTTPS, but I copied and pasted it from my browser, so it'll probably forward HTTPS if you do it. Um, but uh, you know, it's pretty powerful for what it does. It does what I needed to do, so it's not something that I've developed in a while. I was developing it for a couple months um, last year, or two years ago, I forget, last year, and uh, and you know, maybe six months to get it to where I needed it to be. So those limitations still exist. Um, but I never really found the need to go beyond those because it does what I need. If I want it to be a com separated value file, it does it. If I want to run it 10 times with different config files, maybe I have one config file with four variables, you know, I can group it in that kind of a way too, where I can have a MySQL tuner config file for query cache variables only, if I really want. Um, and that's it. So are there any questions or? Do you have an example of configuration file? Yes, I do have an example of a configuration file. Hopefully, I found one. Here we go. Uh, users. Okay, so let me let me do this. Let me go to the display. <coughs> I'm going to mirror my display instead of... Display, arrangement, mirror displays. Okay, so now you can see my display. This one a little less wide. Okay, so can you read that? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so, so if uh, let's see, let me go into MySQL Tuner dash two dot one Revit eighteen. So if you actually download MySQL Tuner, you'll get all of this except for foo. Um, so here is so. 
It's four hundred. It's four hundred forty-five lines. WC dash L lines. Yeah, four hundred forty-five lines of code. So not a big deal. Um, but uh, tuner default dot CNF looks like this. There's uh, okay. let's see. There's ninety-nine lines in it. But I can uh, show you here. Uptime in seconds is less than eight six four zero zero. So you you can add all the lines that you need. Your That's right, and you can delete. You can have a four-line one, you can have a hundred thousand lines, you can do whatever. You know, actually, it, it looks like almost, uh, well, I'm a system, system administrator, I'm not a developer, but uh, I write some tools with Python, in Python, and I'm starting to use unit test, it, because I, I need to test something before making those tools running in production. Mm -hmm. It looks like almost like that, testing. You write your, your, your own test and, and you launch the test and you see what comes back. And then you compare it and yeah. Yeah, yeah and you compare what you say. It is, it is almost like a unit test except, um, yeah, it is like a unit test and now imagine, I mean, this is doing more than one test, yeah. right? So it's, it's, com it's variables from your, from your database. It would be like, uh, I mean, you said you're, you're a system administrator. So, uh, you know, IO stat. It's like running IO stat and getting the number. Yeah. And then putting it somewhere, you know, maybe you just want to run it and look at it, or VM stat also. Maybe you just want to look at it now, but maybe you want to save the very, you know, maybe you're looking at SAR, right? It kind of does what SAR does, right? You yeah. can, okay, yeah. you if you if you run this from cron every five minutes, it could be like what SAR does if you use the uh, the, the output. So yeah, it is very it is very similar to a unit test because in the same ways that looking at IO test is, IO stat is like a, okay. a unit test. Sure. No, it's a, it's a good observation. It's a good point. It's just a different paradigm because it's more it's more of getting the status of the system as opposed to testing functionality. But I, I see the analogy, um, and it looks like unit testing probably because you you're give, of what you give it, right? I mean, you don't give IO stat a variable, right, or even SAR. You give it parameters, but you make the interpretation. Yeah. Here, you're pre-making the interpretation, and that is how it's like a unit yeah, test. Exactly. So you have to know what how your DB subway behaves. Right, and so you're basically saying, if it if this if if I give it if if this calculation gives you this result, then it's okay. But if not, then let me know, and that is exactly how it's like a unit test. So. And every single line has to be on the, uh, the one line. Yeah, one line. But you can see some of the lines are longer. Like this is all. If I if I vi it, you know, this is a line. So if I really wanted to be clear, oops, I could do like this. Okay, so every, everything. Oh, everything. See, everything, this is one line. Separated. Yeah. Um, and you know, of course, I specifically say it's not a DBA in a box. It's four DBAs. Basically, it's for people who know what they're doing, who want the calculations to do it. And of course, people are, you know, coming and picking it up and saying, you know, what does this mean? What does that mean? And so, you know, it's not perfect, but um, again, it does what I need, you know. So it does look a little daunting. Like you get here, percent rights. This is a very here's the formula: com insert, com update, com replace, com delete, divided by all the queries: com select insert, so a select insert update, replace delete times a hundred. So this is the percentage of writes versus the percentage of reads is com select divided by all of this. Um, and this is just printing, at, printing it out. Now, how do I know it's printing it out? Because I say if it's less than zero, it says there's a problem with one of these variables. Um, you know, queries per second, reads per second, writes per second, number of queries, connections. And again, these are just if reads per second equals blank, um, things like that. So. I can try. Does it still check the, the number of fragmented tables? What? Does it, Does it still check, check the number of fragmented tables? No, because the way that my switch between one point I checked it isn't exactly right either. So it looks at it looks at the information schema. It does like a show table status, um, and it does, it doesn't look in the information schema because it's it goes for versions even older than that. It looks in the show table status to see if there's like EnoDB more than, if there's a free space more than like four kilobytes. Because that's theoretically, if there was fragmentation, you would see. So it's not quite right anyway, the calculation. 
but that's that's one of the things actually that I was working on that I stopped working on is tables.pl and the idea is get the table size and engine from the, the database then get the table size on disk from the data dir and compare. My ISIM should be exact and EnoDB can be up to 10% off. So I wrote well, a script to... Depending if you have compression. Yes, if, well it should be my ISIM and EnoDB, right? So EnoDB... Would be compression. Uh, but even Barracuda doesn't compress. But yeah, if you specifically say compression, yes. But people aren't using EnoDB compression too much. I think so. You think so? Because I'm still looking at, anyway, whatever. So you could say for compression it could be 10% lower, but again, it's approximate. Um, there's no way to get exact fragmentation. The customer has this problem with compression, with compressed data. Well, there you go. You um, because, because the space in this wasn't, wasn't matching the code, so they were checking the status for information schema. Mm -hmm. So they were confident that they had enough free space on disk. And we were pointing to them. Was, was it spoken? You know, they would save a lot of money if they just bought more disks. We have one client that is like, you know, they have like a 300 gigabyte database. It's not like they have terabytes and terabytes of database. But uh, they just, for like six months, every week they defragment a certain number of data. Like they have to take their, they have to switch things and they, you know, and they defragment tables every week, and you're like, like, and it's it locks the application, so they have to like, you know, fail over the master and defragment. And they do this every week, and you're like, it would save you so much time if you just bought more disk. Anyway. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you got something out of it. Um, and yeah, so let's see. We have get table info, from, get table info from database. Get take get data dir. So this is my Perl code. You said you're not a Perl hacker. I'm not either. Um, if engine equals my isom, you know, here's the file. If, so if engine equals my isom here, where are we here? Then uh, the data, it's going to be in the data dir db food.myd. Now that's not necessarily true. You can actually set in, uh, in when you create a my isom table, you can specify where it goes. So it's making a lot of assumptions, and that's why this doesn't come with my skill too. Partitioning, yeah, partitioning is, the, but again, it was a quick and dirty like how to see if tables are, and that's why it's not a perfect replacement, and that's why MySQL Tuner 1.0 is still there, even though MySQL Tuner 1.0 isn't right either with fragmentation. 